today we're going to do something a little different even. We're going to continue those videos, but I, I think this, this is actually the third week. We showed two videos the first week, three last week. This week we're going to do five of them, and we're going to do them back to back. We're not going to have the little talking sessions that we've been having in the past. We've been talking between videos. We're just going to we're just going to show them back to back. There's be a total of about 25 minutes of videos, but I promise you, every one of them you will enjoy. It's going to be really good. I want to just introduce what's being said with these words. Uh, the Desert News. And this was an article written by Paul Edwards, says this. It says, those utterances known today as the Ten Commandments transformed the world. That's why there's no way you could teach on the life of Moses and not really. If you're really going to cover the life of Moses, you've got to talk about his te the things he taught. And he gave us a word from God, words from God, I should say, that transformed the world. They clarified for an emerging nation of the Bronze Age refugees that deity was not simply manifest through miraculous deliverance. Those straightforward laws gave the men and women of Israel choice and accountability for how each one of them related to the true and living God for how they interceded with one another. What might they mean to us today? As those ten utterances were memorialized and universalized, they provided a code of conduct that honored family, protected life, secured proper property, defined boundaries, enhanced trust, and thereby secured the foundation for, for cohesive and productive social interaction. The Ten Commandments launched into human history the hypothesis that a society could be peacefully ordered under a rule of generally acceptable laws rather than the forceful whim of autocrats. The World History Encyclopedia says this about the Ten Commandments. It says the Ten Commandments introduced the legislative the legislation received by Moses on Mount Sinai after the Israelites escaped from Egypt. The Ten Commandments are often used as shorthand for the basic rules that govern the worship of God, the God of Israel, as well as ethical principles that govern human relationships. The commandments remain central to the Abrahamic faiths of Western culture, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So three of the world's major religions are basically founded upon, built upon the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments. So the Ten Commandments basically not only changed America, it changed, it changed the world. And so that's why it's so important for us to study them and understand them. And that's why I'm showing you these videos because it will help you to understand them in a deeper way, so much deeper than you've ever understood them before, I promise you. These next five are going to be awesome, so get ready. Let's go ahead and play the videos. Joseph, you, you can start now. You would think that of all the Ten Commandments, the one that needs the least explaining is the sixth because it seems so clear. It is the one that the King James Bible, the most widely used English translation of the Bible, translates as, thou shalt not kill. Yet the truth is quite the opposite. This is probably the least well understood of the Ten Commandments. The reason is that the Hebrew original does not say, do not kill, it says, do not murder. Both Hebrew and English have two words for taking a life. One is kill, harag in Hebrew, and the other is murder, ratzach in Hebrew. The difference between the two is enormous. Kill means, one, taking any life, whether of a human being or an animal. Two, taking a human life, deliberately or by accident. Three, taking a human life, legally or illegally, morally or immorally. On the other hand, 
Murder can only mean one thing, the illegal or immoral taking of a human life. That's why we say, I killed a mosquito, not I murdered a mosquito. And that's why we would say the worker was accidentally killed, not the worker was accidentally murdered. So why did the King James translation of the Bible use the word kill rather than murder? Because 400 years ago when the translation was made, kill was synonymous with murder. As a result, some people don't realize that English has changed since 1610 and therefore think that the Ten Commandments prohibits all killing. But of course it doesn't. If the Ten Commandments forbade killing, we would all have to be vegetarians. Killing animals would be prohibited. And we would all have to be pacifists, since we could not kill even in self-defense. However, you don't have to know how the English language has evolved in order to understand that the Ten Commandments could not have prohibited all killing. The very same part of the Bible that contains the Ten Commandments, the five books of Moses, the Torah as it is known by Jews, commands the death penalty for murder, allows killing in war, prescribes animal sacrifice, and allows eating meat. A correct understanding of the commandment against murder is crucial because while virtually every modern translation correctly translates the commandment as do not murder, many people cite the King James translation to justify two positions that have no biblical basis, opposition to capital punishment and pacifism. Regarding capital punishment and the Bible, the only law that appears in each one of the five books of Moses is that murderers be put to death. Opponents of the death penalty are free to hold the view that all murderers should be allowed to live, but they are not free to cite the Bible to support their view. Yet many do, and they always cite the commandment, do not kill. But that, as should now be abundantly clear, is not what the commandment says, and it is therefore an invalid argument. As regards pacifism, the belief that it is always wrong to kill a human being, again, anyone is free to hold this position, as immoral as it may be, and what other word than immoral can one use to describe forbidding the killing of someone who was in the process of murdering innocent men, women, and children in, let's say, a movie theater or a school? But it is dishonest to cite the commandment against murder to justify pacifism. There is moral killing, most obviously when done in self-defense against an aggressor, and there is immoral killing. And the word for that is murder. The Ten Commandments are portrayed on two tablets. The Five Commandments on the second tablet all concern our treatment of fellow human beings. The first one on that list is do not murder. Why? Because murder is the worst act a person can commit. The other four commandments prohibiting stealing, adultery, giving false testimony, and coveting are all serious offenses. But murder leads the list because deliberately taking the life of an innocent person is the most terrible thing we can do. The next time you hear someone cite do not kill, when quoting the Sixth Commandment, gently but firmly explain that it actually says, do not murder. There's an old joke about the Seventh Commandment, do not commit adultery. Moses comes down from Mount Sinai and announces, I have good news and bad news. The good news is that I got him down to 10. The bad news is that adultery stays. The joke is telling. The prohibition on a married person having sexual relations with anyone except his or her spouse may be for many people the most consistently difficult of the Ten Commandments to observe. The reasons shouldn't be hard to guess. One is the enormous power of the sex drive. It can be very hard to keep in check for the entirety of one's marriage, especially when an attractive outsider makes him or herself sexually or romantically available. Another reason is the human desire to love and be loved. 
For normal people, there is no more powerful emotion than love. If one falls in love with someone while married, it takes great effort not to commit adultery with that person. And if we add in the unfortunate circumstance of a loveless marriage, adultery becomes even more difficult to resist. That's why the joke with which I began is funny, because it reflects truth. Why is adultery prohibited in the Ten Commandments? Because, like the other nine, it is indispensable to forming and maintaining higher civilization. Adultery threatens the very building block of the civilization that the Ten Commandments seeks to create. That building block is the family, a married father and mother and their children. Anything that threatens the family unit is prohibited in the Bible. Adultery is one example. Not honoring one's father and mother is another. And the prohibition on injecting any sexuality into the family unit, incest, is a third example. Why is the family so important? Because without it, social stability is impossible. Because without it, the passing on of society's values from generation to generation is impossible. Because commitment to a wife and children makes men more responsible and mature. Because more than anything else, family meets most women's deepest emotional and material needs. And nothing comes close to the family in giving children a secure and stable childhood. And why does adultery threaten the family? The most obvious reason is that sex with someone other than one spouse can all too easily lead to either or both spouses leaving the marriage. Adultery should not automatically lead to divorce, but it often does. There is another reason adultery can destroy a family. It can lead to pregnancy and then to the birth of a child. That child will, in almost all cases, start out life with no family, meaning no father and mother married to each other to call his or her own. And if adultery doesn't destroy a family, it almost always does terrible harm to a marriage. Aside from the sense of betrayal and loss of trust that it causes, it means that the adulterous partner lives a fraudulent life. When a husband or wife is having sex with someone other than their spouse, their thoughts are constantly about that other person and about how to deceive their spouse. The life of deception that an adulterous affair necessarily entails inevitably damages a marriage, even if the betrayed spouse is unaware of the affair. Finally, the commandment prohibiting adultery doesn't come with an asterisk saying that adultery is okay if both spouses agree to it. Spouses who have extramarital sex with the permission of their husband or wife yeah. may not necessarily be hurting their spouse's feelings, but they are still harming the institution of marriage. And protecting the family, not protecting spouses from emotional pain, is the reason for the commandment. Many marriages, sadly, are troubled. And it is not for any of us to stand in judgment of others' behavior in this realm. No one knows what goes on in anyone else's marriage. And if we did, we might often well understand why one or the other sought love outside the marriage. But no higher civilization can be made or can endure that condones. case can be made that the Eighth Commandment, do not steal, is the one commandment that encompasses all the others. How does do not steal encompass the other commandments? Well, murder is the stealing of another person's life. Adultery is the stealing of another person's spouse. Coveting is the desire to steal what belongs to another person. Giving false testimony is stealing justice, and so on. This commandment is unique in another way. It is the only commandment that is completely open-ended. All the other commandments are specific. The fifth commandment, for example, states that it is our parents whom we should honor. The sixth commandment, prohibiting murder, is about taking the life of an innocent human being. The seventh commandment, prohibiting adultery, is also specific to a married person. Two unmarried people cannot commit adultery. But the commandment against stealing doesn't even hint at what it is we're forbidden to steal which means that we cannot take anything that belongs to another person. 
And that in turn means three big things. First and foremost, the commandment against stealing has always been understood to mean that we are not allowed to steal another human being, what we call kidnapping. That is why no one who had even an elementary understanding of the Eighth Commandment could ever use the Bible to justify the most common form of slavery, the kidnapping of human beings and selling them into slavery. Critics of the Bible argue that the Bible allowed slavery, but the type of slavery described was in almost all cases what was known as indentured servitude, the selling of oneself to another person for a fixed period of time in order to work off a debt. This had nothing to do with kidnapping free people, such as was done in Africa and elsewhere. That was expressly forbidden by the Eighth Commandment. The second significant meaning of the commandment against stealing is the sanctity of people's property. Just as we are forbidden to steal people, we are forbidden to steal what people own. It has been shown over and over that private property, beginning with land ownership, is indispensable to creating a free and decent society. Every totalitarian regime takes away private property rights. In the ancient and medieval world, a few rich people owned all the land, and the majority of the population worked on that land for the enrichment of the owners. And then in 19th century Europe, many socialists argued for taking away private property and giving it to the quote unquote people. Where that advice was followed, in what came to be known as the communist world, theft of property quickly resulted in theft of freedom and ultimately massive theft of life. The third enormously important meaning of the commandment against stealing concerns the many non-material things each person owns. Their reputation, their dignity, their trust, and their intellectual property. Let's quickly run through these. One, a person's reputation. Stealing a person's good name, whether through libel, slander, or gossip, is a particularly destructive form of theft. Because, unlike money or property, once a person's good name has been stolen, it can almost never be fully restored. Two, a person's dignity. The act of stealing a person's dignity is known as humiliation. And humiliating a person, especially in public, can do permanent damage to what is perhaps the most precious thing any of us owns, our dignity. Three, a person's trust. Stealing a person's trust is known as deceiving someone. In fact, in Hebrew, a term for tricking someone is gnevat dat, which literally means stealing knowledge. One example is tricking people into buying something, as when a real estate agent omits telling a prospective purchaser all the flaws in a home in order to make a sale. Another example would be when someone deceives another person with insincere proclamations of love in order to obtain material or sexual favors. Four, a person's intellectual property. This form of theft includes anything from copying software or downloading music and movies without paying for them to stealing a person's words, what we know as plagiarism. Stealing a life, a person, a spouse, material property, intellectual property, a reputation, dignity, or trust, there is hardly any aspect of human life that is not harmed, sometimes irreparably so, by stealing. That is why it is fair to say that if everyone observed only one of the Ten Commandments, observing the commandment do not steal would, all by itself, make a beautiful world. The ninth of the Ten Commandments is, you shall not give false witness against your neighbor. This means two things, do not lie when testifying in court, and do not lie, period. Remember, in order for an action to be prohibited or demanded in the Ten Commandments, it has to be fundamental to making civilization. As important as donkey riding might have been when the Ten Commandments were given, 
The Ten Commandments contains no commandment to ride your donkey responsibly. A society can survive bad donkey drivers, but it cannot survive contempt for truth, whether inside or outside a courtroom. If people testify falsely in a courtroom, there can be no justice, and without even the hope of justice, there can be no civilization. The Hebrew Bible was so adamant on this subject that the punishment imposed on a witness who gave false testimony was the same as the punishment that would have been meted out testimony been believed. In the case of a crime that would be punishable by death, therefore, the false witness was liable to be put to death. But the commandment is clearly concerned with truth generally, not only in a courtroom. Both the great 12th century Jewish commentator Ibn Ezra and one of the most influential biblical scholars of the 20th century, Brevard Childs of Yale University, agreed that the commandment was about truth-telling generally. As Childs pointed out, if the Ten Commandments were solely concerned with truth and falsehood in a courtroom, it would have added words such as, in court. There are many important values in society, but truth is probably the most important. Goodness and compassion may be the most important values in the micro or personal realm, but in the macro or societal realm, truth is even more important than compassion or kindness. Virtually all the great societal evils, such as African slavery, Nazism, and communism, have been based on lies. There were slave traders, Nazis, and communists who were compassionate in their personal lives. But all of them told, and most of them believed, some great lie that enabled them to participate in a great evil. Black slavery was made possible in large measure by the lie that blacks were innately inferior to whites. The Holocaust would have been impossible without tens of millions of people believing the lie that Jews were inherently inferior to so-called Aryans. And communist totalitarianism was entirely based on lies. That's why the Soviet Union's Communist Party newspaper was named Pravda, the Russian word for truth, because the party, not objective reality, was the source of truth. There is only so much evil that can be done by individual sadists and sociopaths. In order to murder millions, vast numbers of otherwise normal, even decent people must believe lies. Mass evil is committed not because a vast number of people seek to be cruel, but because they are fed lies that convince them that what is evil is actually good. However, one big obstacle to truth-telling is that believers in causes, including good causes, that don't place truth as a central value will be very tempted to lie on behalf of their cause. There are many examples. In the 1980s, for example, to promote the cause of the homeless, the leading activist on their behalf claimed that there were two to three million homeless in the United States. Years later, he admitted on national television that he had to come up with a number and made that one up. The real number was between 250,000 and 350,000. Similarly, groups in the fight against cancer were caught greatly exaggerating the number of women who get breast cancer each year. Why? In order to frighten more women into getting mammograms. Again, lying on behalf of a good cause. Why is lying on behalf of good causes destructive? Because if we don't know what's true, how and where do we know how to properly allocate society's limited resources? And in the worst cases, it distorts society's priorities and therefore does great harm. The Ten Commandments is there to warn all of us that with very few exceptions, such as the immediate saving of innocent life, no cause is more important than truth-telling. The Ten Commandments is the greatest list of instructions ever devised for creating a good society, but such a society cannot be created or maintained.
if it is not based on commandments, commandments six, seven, eight, and nine are the ones that prohibit acts of evil, murder, adultery, stealing, and perjury. And then there is one commandment that prohibits the thing that leads to murder, adultery, stealing, and perjury. Which one is it? It's the last of the 10. Do not covet anything that belongs to others, not their spouse, their house, their servants, their animals, or any of their property. In order to understand this commandment and its unique significance, the first thing to understand is that this is the only one of the Ten Commandments that legislates thought. All the other commandments legislate behavior. In fact, of the 613 laws in the five books of Moses, virtually none prohibit thought. Why then does the Ten Commandments include a law that prohibits a thought? Because it is coveting that so often leads to evil. Or to put it another way, coveting is what leads to violating the preceding four commandments, the ones against murder, adultery, stealing, and perjury. Think about it. Why do people do those things? In most instances, it's because they covet something that belongs to another person. Obviously, that is the reason people steal. Thieves covet their victim's property. But it is also the reason for many murders, and coveting is obviously the reason for adultery wanting the spouse of another person. As for perjury, or bearing false witness in the language of the Ten Commandments, that is done in order to cover up all these other crimes that are caused by coveting. But in order to understand why coveting is the one thought that is prohibited in the Ten Commandments, and one of the only thoughts prohibited in the entire Hebrew Bible, we need to understand what coveting means, and equally important, what it doesn't mean. To covet is much more than to want. The Hebrew verb, lachmod, means to want to the point of seeking to take away and own something that belongs to another person. Note that there are two operative elements here, seeking to own and belongs to another person. Seeking to own does not mean just envying, or in the case of your neighbor's spouse, just lusting after. Neither envy nor lust is prohibited in the Ten Commandments. Uncontrolled envy and lust can surely lead to bad things, and they can both be psychologically and emotionally destructive. But neither one is prohibited in the Ten Commandments. Why? Because neither is the same as coveting. It is coveting that almost inevitably leads to stealing, to adultery, and sometimes even to murder. Let me explain this in another way. The Tenth Commandment does not prohibit you from saying, wow, what a great house or car or spouse my neighbor has. I wish I had such a house or car or spouse. That may end up being destructive, but it may also end up being constructive. How? It may spur you to work harder and improve your life so that you can obtain a house or car or spouse like your neighbors. It is when you want and seek to gain possession of the specific house, car, or spouse that belongs to another that evil ensues, and that is what the Tenth Commandment prohibits. Therefore, one of these Ten Commandments, these Ten Basic Rules of Life, must be that we simply cannot allow ourselves to covet what belongs to our neighbor. Whatever belongs to another person must be regarded as sacrosanct. We cannot seek to own anything that belongs to another because only evil can come of it. I'm Dennis Prager.